morning, let me remind you again about um, our big celebration two Sundays from now. Um, we need your RSVP for this by next Sunday, right? And you can, I'll tell you how to do that in just a second after I tell you what it is. Um, we're celebrating Cameron's as he goes and is in, 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 into the humble door, so he's not here for the announcement. Um, Cameron has been serving at this church for 30 years. Well over, and let me emphasize the words, well over a half of his life has been here. He's been serving here. God has graced this church with his influence and his leadership, and we're going to celebrate that two Sundays from, from now. So um, we're going to have, after the service, we're going to have a, uh, uh, on that day, we're going to have a meal in the fellowship hall and some special guests and some special things that will happen in there. Um, but we'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, we just need you to RSVP for that. Um, and if you'll do that by getting, grabbing one of these cards, if you're not a digital type person and can send us your RSVP uh, in digital email type ways or the link that we sent in the, on the Facebook page, you can fill this out and turn it in to Debbie at the church office. You can also email her at info at beulahbaptist.com for your reservation of how many is coming. Or you can go to the link. We'll post it again on, on our small community Beulah Facebook page. We'll post that again today. Follow that link and you can RSVP that way. We just need to know how many to prepare for so we can have adequate food for everyone. All right? So it's going to be a good day. So we're going to celebrate God's grace to his church through Pastor Cameron on that day. Our passage today, um, Jesus is, is, uh, is, at, is at an interesting place. He's He's got a crowd around him. Listen to verse 18, Matthew chapter 8. He said, it says, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. This is the other side of the sea. There was a crowd around Jesus at this time. And if we look back in, in chapter 8 and then uh, at the end of chapter 7, we can kind of see why there was a crowd around Jesus. Look at Let's go all the way back to, um, to chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. This is, bear in mind where this is. This is right after Jesus teaches and preaches the Sermon on the Mount that we know so well. Listen to chapter 7, verses 28 to 29. And when Jesus finished these sayings, when he finished teaching, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. Listen. That is teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. The scribes, we're going to meet a scribe in a minute, but the scribes were the teachers of Jewish law. They were considered the authority of the law. And the crowds were listening to Jesus teach and say, this guy has authority and he teaches even with more authority than our scribes. So they're kind of wowed with Jesus and his teaching. And then jump down to chapter 8, verses 14 to 17, right before our passage today. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick. That's Peter's mother-in-law. He saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. So Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. Verse 16, that evening they brought to him, to Jesus, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and listen to these words, and healed all who were sick. So here's this guy. We know he's God, but here's Jesus. And he's teaching with incredible authority. He's teaching with the authority that they've never seen or experienced or heard before. And they're wowed by him. The crowds are just around him. And then he starts healing people, casting out demons, and healing people of their infirmities. And so, of course, there's a crowd around Jesus. They're wowed by him. People were excited. They were amazed as they gathered around Christ. And here in verse 18, I want you to see this. Jesus gives orders to go to the other side of the sea. Now, why? Why, when a crowd around you, Jesus, would you say, okay, let's go to the other side of the sea? 
The answer to that question ultimately is I don't know. But to just speculate a bit, did he, along with the disciples, need some rest from the crowds? We all know in ministry or in, in any other, I mean, we just got through a wedding this weekend, and, and my goodness, when you're active and ministering and serving and all that kind of stuff, you need some rest, you need some time to pray, you need some time to recoup. Did he need some rest? We know that after this is when he went into the boat. And he slept in the boat while the storm was happening. And the disciples were kind of going, oh my goodness, we're going to drown. Jesus is sleeping. And we know he's sleeping. Did he need rest? Did he need time to rest and pray after ministering to the crowds? Maybe. Was it time for ministry elsewhere? We knew he went and continued to minister. Maybe. Or maybe it's this, as Matthew Henry suggests. Was Jesus seeing who was really serious about following him. Think about this. Here Jesus comes to your town. He's in your town. He's doing all this teaching and doing all this healing in your town. It's easy to follow Jesus when he's near. When he's near to their home and it really costs them nothing. But would these excited followers keep following Jesus when they were asked to leave and follow him? To leave it all behind, like the, like the disciples early on dropped their nets and left their boats. They were fishermen and followed Jesus when Matthew, who wrote this gospel, left his tax table, left his business and followed Jesus. Were all these excited people who were wowed by Jesus and all that he was teaching and doing, were they willing to say, okay, I'm willing to drop it all, I'm willing to leave my home, and Jesus, I really am willing to follow you wherever you go. Would their fervor fade or would it endure? In John chapter 6, we find Jesus doing this, right? He, he feeds the 5,000. He multiplies the fish and the loaves to feed at least 5,000 people, maybe, well, Obviously more. Women and children were there too. It was just 5,000 men. And he feeds all these people, and they're just so wowed by him, they follow him the next day. And then on that day, Jesus sees this crowd that's just, fo this just followed him because he filled their bellies. And Jesus teaches something really, really hard. And the people can't take it. And so the Bible says that many left him after that teaching. So did he pick up and go for all these reasons? For whatever reason, Jesus said it's time to go. And then we get verse 19 and 20. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and, holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So a scribe comes up to Jesus, and he says something incredible. First of all, he calls him teacher. And then he says, I will follow you wherever you go. This was quite a statement. You see, the scribes, along with other religious leaders, they were, they were generally hostile to Jesus. Jesus spoke against them and what they taught and the traditions they added to the Scriptures. The scribes and the Pharisees, and the, they were... They were opposed to Jesus. They were hostile to him. The scribes were educated teachers of Jewish law and seen as authorities in it. And as I said, Jesus opposed much of their teaching of it and their unbiblical man-made religious traditions that they added to it. So for a supposed authority and teacher of Jewish law to call Jesus teacher and say that he'd follow Jesus wherever he went is a great statement of apparent sincerity. At least maybe from his perspective. But did he really understand what he was saying? Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And more, after hearing what it meant to follow Jesus, was he still willing to to follow him wherever he went. Jesus told him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You see, folks, I don't know that we grasp this, but Jesus didn't have a home. 
not in his ministry. Harry Ironside says this, quote, He who had created all things was homeless in his own world and among his own people. End quote. The comfort that foxes have, that birds have, that the average person has, Jesus did not have. The security of going home. The comfort of being in a home that you own, that you call your home, Jesus didn't have. Jesus lived off the kindness and charity of others who provided for his needs and would give him a place to stay in various places he went as he ministered. He, notice what he calls himself, the Son of Man, had no certain place to lay his head. The Son of Man. This is Jesus' favorite title for himself. And it means way more than the fact that he was human. You know, we hear Jesus called the Son of God, and he is. He's God in the flesh. He's in his very essence. He is God. He's the Son of God. But you also hear him. This is his favorite expression of himself, Son of Man. But it means way more than he's just a human, that he's one of us, that he became fully human. He's fully God, but he's also fully human. This reference that Jesus loves to call himself is a reference to his deity, to the fact that he is God, that he's the exalted Messiah in Daniel chapter 7. Listen to these, wor- these, pa- these uh, verses. Daniel chapter 7, there's a vision, and uh, it says this, and behold, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, this is verse 13, sorry, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, capital A, and was presented before him. And to him, this Son of Man, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is a prophecy, a vision of the Son of Man, the Messiah, Jesus, who will have an everlasting kingdom and who will reign over it forever as the King of kings and Lord of lords. So when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, he's not just saying, hey, I was a man like you. He's saying, I'm I'm the fulfillment of the Son of Man prophecy in Daniel. I am the Messiah. I am the exalted divine one. In Matthew 26, 63 to 65, he, he essentially affirms that. I'll leave you to read that on your own. Matthew 26, 63 to 65. So listen to this. He who humbled himself to become one of us, who had no place to lay his head, is the exalted divine Messiah who will rule over God's everlasting kingdom. Don't miss this. At his birth, there was no place for Jesus in the inn. During his public ministry, Jesus did not have a home. Jesus lived in poverty. We who are, who are in Western ways of thinking and living and think about wealth and prosperity and who value that so much and who look down on those in poverty and sometimes attack their, attack their character because they live in poverty, or attack their faith even because they live in poverty. Jesus lived in poverty. He who was rich, the richest of all, who came from heaven, he who was rich became poor. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Did Jesus become poor so we could become materially rich to have dollars in our pockets and our bank accounts full? No. Rich spiritually, Jesus became poor and lived in poverty to be rejected and die on a cross so that he may bear our sin and give us eternal life so that 
spiritually eternal riches, spiritual riches, life with Christ, we could be, though we may be poor earthly, we may be rich spiritually. He became poor so we, might, by his poverty, might become rich. This is the gospel. God is a holy, righteous God who was here before anything was. He has eternally existed, and he is holy and righteous and just. The Bible says that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. He rules in righteousness and justice. And if he rules in righteousness and justice, and he is righteous and just in his very essence, he must be righteous and just when it comes to dealing with sin. And all of us are sinners. We have all fallen short of God's glory, and he who is just, must punish sin or he is not just. So we deserve justice. We deserve condemnation. We deserve eternal hell for our sin against God because all of us have done it and all of us still do it. All of us in our inherent nature are sinners and we sin because we are sinners. But God is compassionate and he is loving and he is merciful. And he sent his son Jesus to live in poverty, to become a human and live in poverty that he might be rejected and, 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 and hung on a cross that, that while Jesus was hanging on Calvary's cross, God might throw on him all of our sin and that the wrath of God that we deserve, the condemnation that we deserve would be poured on Christ. And God would fulfill his righteous anger and wrath against sin by punishing his son. And that right before Jesus died, he would say, it is finished. The punishment, the wrath, the payment, the penalty for our sin was paid in full. Jesus died. And he was risen on the third day, defeating death showing his dominion over death, his dominion over sin, his dominion over Satan, showing that the payment that Christ made for our sin was complete, paid in full. That if we would just recognize that God is holy and that we're sinners and we need salvation, we need forgiveness from our sin so that we can have eternal life and not eternal condemnation, that we could realize that and say, hey, I, I hate my sin, I see what I've done. I see who I am before God, and I want to turn from my sin because I need forgiveness from it. I need to live for the glory of God. I want to turn from my sin, and I want to place my faith, all of my faith, not in what I can do, but in what Jesus has done for me for my salvation. I want to trust in Him and His work that I might be saved. And when we do that, church, online listener, guest with us today, when we do that, the Bible says that God forgives our sin, wipes the slate clean, and he does something even more magnificent, or equally as magnificent, I should say. He gives you a gift, and that gift is the righteous record of Jesus Christ, who never sinned. He takes your unrighteous record, and he gives you Jesus' righteous record, and he, as if to say, you know, here's... Here's Jesus' record of perfect righteousness. I'm giving it to you, Ken, that before me now you can plead his righteous record and not your unrighteous record, and I can welcome you into eternal life and fellowship with me forever because your sin is forgiven and you are seen legally as perfectly righteous. It's a glorious gift of grace. That's the gospel. Jesus be became poor and had no place to lay his head so that he could give you the riches of salvation and grace and mercy forever. The everlasting God who came from the comforts and wealth of heaven came to earth to give and gave up comforts and had no material wealth. That is incredible humiliation. So Jesus is telling this scribe that to follow him, if this scribe is going to follow Jesus, this scribe is going to have to be willing to give up earthly comforts. And he tells us that as well. To follow Jesus, we must give up earthly comforts. 
We don't just add Jesus to our life. We don't just consider ourselves an American Christian, right? We're an American. We're, we're, we've got rights. We've got the pursuit of the American dream. We've got all this. That's just foundational, right? Built in us that I'm, I'm expected to go live a great, awesome life. Oh, and I need Jesus too, and I'm going to add him as the cherry on top of my life. No. No. Jesus isn't the accessory to the wedding dress. No. Jesus isn't the accessory to the life we want to lead. Jesus isn't the way to fulfill all our dreams. No, no. We give up everything to follow Jesus, and whatever that means, whatever obedience to God's word requires, whatever his call on our life calls for in every situation of life, whatever it means we lose, we're willing to part ways with it. To follow Jesus faithfully, there's going to be sacrifices. There's going to be great sacrifices. A loss of earthly comfort. A loss of the pursuit of wealth. It was for Jesus. It will be for us. This goes completely counter to the prosperity gospel. If you hear preachers on TV or online things that say God wants you to be rich and He wants you to be healthy and He wants you to be... He, 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 he wants you to have so much faith that, that, that you never get sick or you never are poor. or you That is not the gospel. David Platt says this, quote, You shouldn't come to Jesus to get stuff. You come to Jesus to get Jesus. End quote. Following Jesus, there are no guarantees of earthly comfort and earthly wealth. Oh, he may bless us with it sometimes. But there's no guarantees. So church, here's my, here's my green part. Here's my application part. If in this life, all we get is Jesus, is He enough? If all earthly possessions, if all earthly securities, if all earthly comforts were gone, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus worthy enough to lose everything for? Everything? If following Jesus demands losing earthly comforts, are you still in? We, I'm going to bend my toes back because I'm about to step on my own toes. We who are so obsessed with worldly wealth and comforts must remember the condition in which our Savior came to save us and be more obsessed with following Him faithfully and whatever sacrifices that brings rather than obsessing over our idols and obtaining earthly comforts and wealth. Again, David Platt says this, quote, following Christ may mean losing everything in this world. End quote. You don't believe me? Remember, we live in America. We don't know this, but you just asked my friend Jack. And I'll try, to, I'll try to tell you this story without choking up because it breaks my heart. In our experience as a church, in our mission trips to Africa, there was this young man, I'll just call him Jack. Jack was a young believer, like these graduates. He came to Christ on one of our first, I think maybe our first trip to Africa, maybe the second. Jack had an apparent fervor, and faithfulness and desire for God's Word and, and following Jesus. Every time we went, he was there almost all the time, listening to the Bible studies, getting engaged. I remember being over there. I can still see this picture I have in the, in the dark African night where there, you know, we're out in the village, so there's no electricity. It's just the stars in the sky and, and, and any flashlights we had. And we had just finished the teaching and we were about to present Jack with his first Bible in a language he could read. I think it was French. Maybe it was Bambara. I can't remember. But it was his first Bible. And I remember sitting there. I got, a, I got a picture of me sitting in a chair and Jack sitting right beside me. And we've got a flashlight. We're sweating because it's so hot in Africa. And we're sweating. And I'm showing him 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching that verse. And I'm showing him this. And I'm trying to encourage him and show him the value of God's word. And Jack 
loves that Bible. Every time we go back, he's there, he's faithful, he's faithful, he's faithful. Well, time came whenever we couldn't go to Africa or we didn't go to Africa much anymore. I kept getting calls from Jack. It wasn't long before I got calls and messages from Jack saying, I'm no longer following Christ. And I said, why? He said, because when I identify, he didn't say it in these words, but this is what he said. When I identify myself with Jesus as a Christian, no one will give me a job. And at the need for money, a way to provide for himself, he bailed on Jesus for earthly comforts. I remember coming home from vacation, Steph was driving, weeping as I was Facebook messaging him, pleading with him. And to this day, I don't know that he's ever turned back to Christ. Listen to me, church. When we do not let people know the costs that being a disciple of Christ entails, we set them up for misplaced expectations and we misrepresent God and his word. When you and I present to this world that Jesus will fix all your problems and make your life comfortable, healthy, wealthy, and wise, when it doesn't happen, they will bail on Jesus when their expectations are not met. Because to them, most of the time, Jesus is a means to an end. He's not the end himself. Now, let me be clear. We're not saved by our sacrifices We're not saved by giving up earthly comforts. We are saved by grace alone through faith alone. Let me be clear in that. Yet having this type of sacrificial devotion to him, willing to give up everything, that's a fruit of one who has true saving faith. And this is what the life of a faithful disciple of Jesus looks like. And knowing that keeps some people from putting initial saving faith in Christ to begin with. Oh, please don't let that be you. The scribe's declaration of following Jesus wherever he went, that was not insignificant. Don't miss this. Yet bold professions of faith are not always genuine when they're tested by struggles and sacrifice and temptation. Just think about Peter. Peter, I will die for you. And then just hours later, he denies Christ three times. Demas, we find in 2 Timothy 4.10, was a follower, but then he left. The parable of the soils, you remember those, the four soils? I'll just reference Matthew 13. The scribe may have seen Jesus' power, his compassion, his miracles, his teaching, his popularity as being from God and wanted to be associated with him. But what about when Jesus told him what it was going to cost to follow him? Was he so ready to follow then? You see, many are so attracted to Jesus, they get excited about him, they start off apparently strong with their profession, their commitment seems real, it seems unshakable, but when sacrifice and the cost of following Jesus becomes apparent, you see their interest fade, you see their commitment wane, and you see their profession merely superficial. So, how do you respond when the call of discipleship requires you to sacrifice and suffer? Does your profession of Christ prove true? By your willing sacrifice? Is Jesus just a bandwagon to you? Is Jesus a phase of life that you'll soon be over once life becomes comfortable again? Is commitment to Him for you negotiable? You see, if we have a wrong idea of what it means to follow Jesus, then the initial excitement of following Him like this scribe, maybe, we don't know how he responds, the initial excitement of following him is highly prone to wear off 
when sacrifice is required or expectations aren't met. But if we are drawn to Jesus for who he is and what he has done and following him as Lord of our lives, no matter what that costs, then we gladly and willingly do so to follow him faithfully no matter what it costs. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up his cross did not mean bear my heavy burden on this earth. I mean, it might have application for that, but the disciples knew what that meant. A cross was a reminder of death and execution. Jesus was saying, if anybody would come after me, let him be willing, ready. Uh, Let him deny himself and, and be willing to die for me. And follow me. Church, this world is not our home. Let's be reminded, these days, this world is not our home. We lose attachment to it and the comforts it offers to faithfully follow Jesus. He's the Son of Man. He's God. He gave His life that we could live forever. He is worthy of any sacrifice we can give to follow Him faithfully. Let's look at the last two verses before we leave. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. This guy's described as a disciple. Who was it? I don't know. But he was following Jesus to some degree. Attracted to his ministry, his teaching, his miracles, the excitement that was brewing around Jesus, just as the scribe was. But in the prospect of following Jesus across the sea and wherever he was going, this disciple said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. So here's the question that no one really knows. Had his father really just died? Or maybe he was near death? And this man, this disciple, wanted to do, do the devoted thing, the God-honoring thing, the Jewish custom, the, uh, the honorable thing to bury his father, one last devotion to his father. That was an honorable thing. That would be obedient to God, yes. Had his father really just died or he was near death and he wanted to go perform that last rite for him? Or if he was near death, did he, was he just wanting to spend those last days with him? because of a tight relationship, and then bury him honorably? Or was there more to it? Because we have reason to believe, knowing phrases that were used then, and maybe even still today, that bury my father might mean more than just putting him in the ground. Was he using... A phrase that meant that he wanted to stay with his father until he died because he valued his relationship with him or more, he valued the inheritance that he would receive by being a faithful son until his dad died. Hmm. You see, if this was the case, then as John MacArthur says, he wanted to be associated with Jesus in name but the focus of his life was on his personal prosperity and well-being, not on serving the Lord, end quote. So regardless of his reason for the excuse, Jesus tells him this, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Luke tells us this same story, but he says that Jesus said one more thing to this man that Matthew doesn't tell us, he says. Luke tells us that Jesus said, leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Ah. Jesus is saying this, that spiritually dead people who aren't concerned with proclaiming the kingdom of God, they can handle things like burials. This man, this disciple's first priority must be on following Jesus. It is honorable for this man to... Is it honorable for this man to want to bury his father? Yes, it is. But more significant than than that is this man following Jesus. That has to be his priority. There will be those of this world 
concerned primarily with the things of the world, the spiritually dead, who will be able to handle things like burials. Or maybe if the idea is that the disciple wanted to receive his inheritance, then Jesus' response may be intended to say this, that unbelievers, unbelievers prioritize earthly things and gaining earthly inheritances, earthly well-being, earthly prosperity, but those that follow Jesus are to have different priorities. Let worldly unbelievers go after those things. True disciples of Jesus are willing to sacrifice those things to follow Jesus and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, did Jesus mean we can't plan funerals? Absolutely not. Honor those who died? He was not saying that. But for this man, at this moment, in this situation, that's what he told him. R.C. Sproul says this, Jesus was simply reminding this man that the call of God on his life was absolute and immediate. There was no earthly excuse that would permit him to avoid the call. I want you, and I want you now. Follow me. Sproul continues, when Jesus calls us, it is an absolute call, a sovereign call, a divine call. Such a call demands an immediate response. End quote. So our affection for Jesus should overwhelm our affection for our family and our affection for earthly well-being and earthly prosperity, earthly wealth. Whatever we must sacrifice to follow Jesus faithfully, we should, we should be willing to do so without delay. Our loyalty is to be to Him above all other people and all other things. Look at what this disciple did. Just look at what he did. He had the opportunity to follow the Son of Man, the Messiah of God, who will reign forever in an everlasting kingdom, the forever reigning Lord, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, God Himself. And instead of dropping everything and readjusting His priorities and sacrificing all to respond to such an incredible opportunity, He placed conditions upon God concerning following Him. He actually had the audacity to look in the face of God God in the flesh, and say, Lord, let me first. Wow. How arrogant. How arrogant. How short-sighted. How selfish. How worldly. Do we do that? Lord, let me first. Or, or, or God, yes, I'll follow you, but if you'll just add this to what it means to follow. No conditions are to be put on the call to be a disciple of Jesus. We don't bargain with the Lord about following him. He isn't begging you to follow Him. Receiving you any way you'll come. Oh, I'll just, you know, sometimes my kids, you, you, know, you know how it is. You, all of you have kids, you're just like, I just want them to do this one thing. And if they'll just do that one, you know, and we almost bargain with them, right? Just eat this. Okay, just eat one bite of it, you know. God's not bargaining with you to get you to follow Him. As if you meet around a table and discuss conditions of your discipleship. He says, this is what it means to follow me. You in? You come his way. He calls, we obey. And he is worth dropping everything to follow. What a glorious privilege. So, do you either knowingly or unknowingly place conditions upon following Jesus? Lord, I'll follow you if. You make me healthy if you fix my earthly situation, if you give me that job, if it's just not too hard and doesn't cost too much. Are you redefining what it means to follow Jesus to include your worldly allegiances and desires for personal prosperity and well-being? Are you willing to sacrifice anything to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, laying down any excuse and yielding to his authority? How did these two men respond? I don't know. I listened to some messages and read some commentaries that assumed that these guys turned away and followed Jesus, just like the rich young ruler. Remember when Jesus said, sell all your possessions, give them to the poor, and the rich young ruler went away sad because he was, he was rich. I don't know how these guys responded. 
How will you respond to the call to follow Jesus? Listen to J.C. Ryle on Jesus' responses to these guys. Foxes have holes and then leave the dead to bury their dead. Listen. J.C. Ryle says this, There is something deeply impressive in both these sayings. They ought to be well weighed by all professing Christians. They teach us plainly that people who show a desire to come forward and profess themselves true disciples of Christ should be warned plainly to count the cost before they begin. Are they prepared to endure hardship? Are they ready to carry the cross? End quote. Again, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Oh, church, there is a crown. There's a crown. It's coming. But the crown comes through a cross. The glory comes through hardship. What we will savor forever in our relationship with Christ comes through sacrifice. There's a crown, but there's a cost as well. But is not Jesus worthy of sacrificing everything for? Even if it means our own lives. Jesus bore our sins and he took God's wrath for them. And he gave his life that we may live forever. And he calls us to repent of our sin and trust in him and his work on Calvary. Receive salvation by faith alone. Willing to follow him faithfully no matter the cost. What a glorious privilege you have been given. Yes, being a disciple of Christ involves sacrifice, but let nothing keep you from it. No worldly comfort, no worldly wealth, no worldly well-being, no worldly allegiance can even begin to match the glorious privilege of glorifying and following the heavenly King, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, who will reign forever with His people in the glory of eternal life, and may following Him faithfully be our ultimate priority, our central priority, no matter the cost. May we be a people who follow Him in unreserved, unconditional, sacrificial obedience and faithfulness because church, Jesus Christ is worthy. Let's pray. God, I pray this morning that by Your glorious grace You would open even wider and more clearer my eyes to how my life is being clouded by worldly comforts. That I don't even see you're keeping me from following you faithfully. God, would you by your grace for me lead me leave anything I have to follow you. And I pray this for my brothers and my sisters in this room who are told every day in so many ways that our lives in this world are supposed to be comfortable and rich. Fleeing hardship, fleeing suffering. Oh God, help us see the call to follow you and let nothing, nothing, be too great or too attractive to leave to follow you. God, I pray that my brothers and sisters in Christ, those maybe in this room that have not given their lives to you yet, 
Oh, Father, that we would be found faithful as true disciples, willing to leave it all because, oh, Jesus, you're so worthy. You're so worthy. Forgive us, God, for whenever we make other things more worthy than you. 